Okay, so let's get started. Um, so I'm Daniel. I work at Elastic in the Elastic Search team, and I do uh, performance analysis, performance improvements, and uh, benchmarking there. And uh, today I want to share with you uh, a few tips and tricks uh, when you do your own benchmarks. And although I talk about Elasticsearch, it's not so much about Elasticsearch. You can really apply those tips uh, also uh, when you benchmark other systems. So who of you knows about Elasticsearch, what it is on a high level? Okay, so uh, most of you. Uh, for those that don't know Elasticsearch, it's basically a search engine that you can integrate into your own application. And what's also important about it is uh, it's a distributed search engine, so you can basically scale it by adding more nodes. And this is basically all you need to know uh, about Elasticsearch for this talk. So let's get started. And uh, imagine you're standing at the water cooler um, when suddenly your colleague Ben approaches you. And Ben is on your application search team and he tells you, uh, you know, we recently uh, did some configuration changes to Elasticsearch and I got a production dump and I want to find out whether those changes are really uh, improving performance or not. So I ran a load test and uh, checked the numbers, but I'm not quite, uh, quite sure whether I got it right. Uh, would you mind having a look? And you say, sure. And so you head over to Ben's desk and have a look at the benchmark. And while you do that, let's take a minute to reflect what uh, Ben just said about benchmarking uh, to capture his essence. So he said uh, he ran a load test, so he ran a well-defined workload against uh, his benchmarking target, which was Elasticsearch. Uh, he measures some performance metrics like throughput or latency. And then you change a parameter, like uh, you upgrade Elasticsearch or the JDK, or you do some kernel change or uh, reconfigure, uh, reconfigure Elasticsearch. And then you run the, test, the load test again and compare the results. That's basically what benchmarking is. And this now brings us to our, to our first rule. And this rule applies before you even start your benchmark. You need to think about your system setup. How is your software and your, your hardware um, set up? As you approach Ben's desk, you see this. And Ben, ben tells you, you know, I ran those uh, benchmarks on my notebook. And you say, well, does your Elasticsearch system run on a notebook in production? And for sure not. It usually runs on some kind of server. Uh, which is uh, usually either lin Linux or Windows based. But uh, I, didn't, I have yet to hear about a server that runs on Mac OS X. Um, so the first rule, in order for your results to be relevant, uh, your system should be really close to production. This means you run on the same hardware, so the same CPU, the same disk type, the same uh, memory, the same network configuration, because those things really matter. So different CPUs have different, uh, for example, different cache sizes, mm -hmm. different numbers of cores, a different architecture, and this matters. Uh, same goes for other hardware components. Also, you should run on the same software. This means you should run, first of all, on the same operating system, not macOS versus Linux, uh, but also you should use the same kernel version, the same JVM version, and the same Elasticsearch version. And those systems should also be identically uh, configured. But relevance is only part of the solution. You also need to reduce noise in order to get better reproducible numbers. Because if you uh, repeat the same benchmark in the same configuration, you sh should get somewhat uh, similar numbers. So this means the environment needs to be stable. So you do not just do system upgrades uh, on that system. Uh, you should also turn off system demons, like you do not want to have some kind of background job in the middle of your benchmark running and skewing your, uh, skewing your results. Uh, also, uh, one thing that a lot of people also uh, often uh, do wrong is that they have the load generator on the same machine. And this is problematic for a number of reasons, actually. 
Uh, first of all, the load generator then contends for resources with Elasticsearch or with your benchmark target in general. But also you run via loopback and loopback uh, behaves entirely differently on kernel level and also on network level than an Ethernet connection. So you should really have the load generator on a separate machine or multiple separate machines. And in between those ma all those machines, you should have a low latency, high throughput network and no other traffic on that network. Uh, one example from our own nightly benchmarks, uh, where you can actually see noise in, uh, in reality is, uh, ca you can see is here. This graph shows indexing throughput, which basically means how quickly can we add data to Elasticsearch and higher numbers are better. And it shows indexing throughput over time for multiple configurations. So each line there that you see is basically a different configuration of Elasticsearch. And you see this nice up and down pattern. This is a weekly pattern. And well, it could mean that on Mondays we are totally motivated. We are fixing performance problems. And over the week, it's, the, it's reg regressing and it gets worse. Uh, but it might be also something else. So, and it turns out that our system had an SSD on it. And um, by default, there is um, a job that runs every week uh, that trims the SSDs, that basically tells the SSD what data on the disk is actually uh, deleted. Uh, so, um, and this specific benchmark was quite um, um, sensitive to this. So uh, it showed up in the data. And af after we've enabled trim in the benchmarks, you can immediately see uh, what, res uh, what that ma meant for stability. We get much more stable results. So on the next day, Ben comes to you and says, oh, I've, I used now our pre-production system, which is uh, totally uh, identically configured. Um, and ran the benchmarks again, but somehow it still doesn't look right to me. So, and you know that Ben is not exactly a morning person, and you ask him, Ben, are you really awake before your first coffee? And Ben is always a little bit grumpy, and he says, no, I really need my morning coffee, and uh, uh, in order to, or otherwise I cannot start working, really. I, and the same is really true for... Uh, software systems as well. So you cannot expect peak performance from the first second. For example, uh, every, um, the JVM has a built-in uh, compiler, uh, just-in-time compiler that runs while the ap uh, with the application. And the way it works is basically, usually you start out in the interpretive mode and then you gather, uh, gather more and more data uh, at runtime. And uh, the JVM then uh, detects hot code paths and then tells the JIT compiler, it issues a compilation request to the JIT compiler and then the JIT compiler will compile this. And what I did here uh, is basically I measured how many ch compilation requests we get per second uh, after startup and uh, plotted this over time. And you can see that the JIT compiler in the beginning is it's rather active uh, and then it's, um, it's getting more quiet and you see then a, li a little bump after a while, and this is when the workload has changed. So, and you need to consider this in your uh, workload definition, that you actually uh, do not uh, consider those time periods for measurement, but rather uh, use those uh, for warm-up of the application and only start to measure when the application has stabilized. Um. A second aspect that you need to consider in war during warm-up is basically caching. So you have lots of caches uh, from the hardware layer up to the application layer. Uh, for example, your CPU has a level one until usually level three cache and a prefetching unit. Uh, your disk has a cache to absorb IO spikes. Um, also, if you do a buffered write, um, it's not that the data go immediately to disk, but rather they end up first in the applications, uh, in the operating system's page cache, and are then uh, flushed to disk asynchronously. Also, your application has uh, caches usually. For example, Elasticsearch is a short request cache and a node query cache. And you need to consider that uh, you uh, will hit those caches. And if we combine all this, uh, it may look like this. Um, this shows indexing throughput in a single benchmark over time. 
and I've uh, I've colored uh, the warm-up phase in red and the actual measurement phase in blue. And what you see is basically that uh, the application throughput is uh, steadily rising over time, and we you even see a small peak there. And this is basically buffers absorbing uh, the initial load, and over time the application stabilizes, and then we start to measure. Another misconception that people often have is, uh, with benchmarks, I really need to stress my system as much as I can. Uh, but as you see now in, in rule three, uh, it's really more important that you actually capture your production workload and uh, measure this instead of uh, stressing the system uh, as much as you can. Uh, consider you're on your way to work and uh, you stop by a nearby coffee shop uh, to grab a coffee. And guess what? A lot of other people have the same idea. And this means a waiting line will build up in the coffee shop. You cannot order your coffee immediately. So you have to wait for some time period. Let's call this the waiting time. After a while, you will be in front of this waiting line and uh, you can place your order with the barista. And the time it takes the barista to prepare your coffee um, is called the service time. And if we add those two components up, we have latency. So latency is really the sum of the waiting time, the time you spend in the waiting line, plus the time it takes the barista to prepare your coffee. And if you go to the coffee shop, say at 9 p.m. or so, uh, considering the coffee shop is still open, there's probably not a whole lot of people in there. And the barista is rather bored, uh, so and there is no waiting line. You just go to the barista and can, um, and can place your order. So here, um, latency is dominated by service time. Contrary, at 8 a.m., a lot of people are in the, in the coffee shop uh, the barista is constantly busy and a waiting line will build up and uh, there you spend most of the time really in the waiting line and not uh, waiting for your coffee. So here latency is dominated by waiting time. And uh, before we can make sense of all of this, uh, we need to ha add one more piece to that. This is, this is also, uh, we talked about utilization. Uh, but utilization is really a relative measure. It's independent of the system. It's like between zero and 100%. Um, in, in real systems, uh, you're interested in, in throughput. So, uh, and throughput means 100% uh, utilization means different throughput for different systems. So you see here in this picture, uh, the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, and on the uh, right lower corner, you see a little on-ramp. And the Bay Bridge has a lot of lanes, and so a lot of cars uh, can uh, can drive uh, over the Bay Bridge, uh, but not so many uh, on this little on-ramp. So 100% utilization means different throughput or number of cars for the on-ramp as uh, compared to the uh, Bay Bridge. And if we now plot all this, uh, we might get a graph like this. This shows latency over utilization. And in the beginning, uh, at 0% utilization, as I said before, we ha basically have uh, a very low latency that is dominated by service time. And as we increase utilization more and more, um, we will reach some tipping point where, uh, uh, where latency sharply rises and it's dominated by waiting time. And uh, usually, you will not want to operate your systems at 100% utilization because you get uh, latency spikes, you get unpredictable behavior. Uh, so you will rather have uh, maybe uh, operate them at 70 or at 80% utilization. Um, and the same, and you have to do the same in your benchmarks. Otherwise, uh, you're measuring something unrealistic. So it's important to actually throttle throughput and not run at maximum throughput there when you're interested in, in utilization. Um, some general tips here. Uh, if you benchmark batch operations, in the case of Elasticsearch, it would be bulk indexing, so adding documents where you, wherever you have like a batch job. Uh, the important metrics here is really throughput. Uh, because 
you do not really care whether your batch job is uh, is paused for a minute, for example, if it finishes five minutes sooner. Then you do not care about pauses in between. So you really care about maximum throughput, and you should also run at maximum throughput. However, you should watch the error rate, like if you get uh, time uh, network timeouts, bug rejections, and then, because this is a sign that you've overloaded the system, and then you need to reduce load if necessary. For interactive operations, like when you do a search, uh, you need to consider latency, because interactive means a human is involved, and we're not really good at waiting. We do not want to wait. So you want to keep latency uh, uh, rather low, and there uh, you should run at a defined throughput, as I've shown you before. And you can use your production metrics for guidance. So if you have like a, a car website or something like this, you might be able to search for cars on that, on that website. And if you get, I don't know, 10 hits per second or so, this might be then a guidance for uh, how many, uh, how uh, high your throughput should be. If your load testing tool is able to measure latency and service time separately, uh, and you see that latency is much higher than service time, uh, this is a clear sign that the system is saturated, as we've seen before in that hockey stick graph. For latency, we also need to consider uh, a little bit more. Uh, namely, usually you want to model m not a single client, but rather multiple clients. And for this, you need to consider how your clients will actually arrive at your system. So uh, in this graph, I've used a uh, deterministic schedule uh, at the rate of one operation per second or one query per second. Uh, so every, every dot on this graph means a client is arriving. So it's arriving at second zero, at second one, two, three, and so on. And this is a rather simple model. It's easy to understand. But consider that you model 100 clients with this. This would mean that 100 clients entered the system at second zero, at second one, at second two. This is, um, this is often unrealistic, because it would mean for, uh, that your users somehow need to coordinate. And if you consider that you have some kind of internet service or something li like that, uh, it's unrealistic that your users really behave like that. And it also means that um, requests will pile up at your system and you have latency spikes. A different model uh, is the so-called uh, Poisson uh, distribution. It's a probabilistic model, and this graph really shows the same uh, um, average uh, arrival rate of one query per second. But as you see, it's it's not evenly split out, but it's rather randomly. Um, so sometimes requests come in uh, in bursts, and sometimes requests are further apart. And each client decides on their own when they will hit the system. So one client might uh, be, uh, in the beginning, might be a little bit uh, bursty and then have larger pauses. Another client might have larger pauses in the beginning and then a little bit bursty. And overall, you will see uh, a rather steady rate. And this is often more real realistic, actually, because it models independent users. So each one decides on their own uh, when they will hit your system. Um, and here you can see a comparison, really, uh, of latency over time. Uh, in blue, you see uh, the same query rate, basically, um, with uh, 300 concurrent clients. And in uh, red, it's uh, Poisson schedule. And you see the latency spikes that the, uh, uh, that the deterministic schedule uh, really produces, contrary to the uh, Poisson schedule. Um, so we now had a look uh, at our hardware software setup. Um, we also checked uh, the benchmark itself. Uh, and we now have a look at the benchmarking software. Um, so and for some reason, um, people uh, seem to trust benchmarking software more than other software because it produces very, uh, very uh, precise numbers. However, um, also, uh, this software can have bugs, and or it's also it can also happen that you have uh, a, like a typo in your in your benchmark. Consider, for example, you're testing a REST service, and you're misspelling instead of orders, you write orders, something like that, and you run your benchmark, 
and everything is quick and fine, and you deploy to production, and boom, uh, response times are much, uh, much higher than you have expected. And the reason was that you had this typo in it, and the system produced a 404 and didn't really do any, any real work. So it just checked, oh, I don't know about the path 404. Uh, and in production, uh, your production software didn't contain that typo, uh, and therefore uh, you always hit the endpoint and did the real work and uh, response times were high. The second aspect to consider is uh, your, load gener your load generator will have some maximum throughput that you can achieve, and you should measure, uh, and, measure and know about that. Uh, otherwise, uh, it might happen that your load generator is the actual bottleneck and not so much the system that you're testing. In the next few slides, I want to show you a few specific examples that I've encountered in the wild about those benchmarks, about uh, benchmark problems with benchmarking software. So the first example is a small Python script uh, consisting of three lines. So in the first line, we basically initialize the client with an array of hosts. Uh, that the um, that the benchmarking software will target, and then in a while loop, we are sending always uh, data in bulk to Elasticsearch, and what happened is basically that this benchmarking tool choose the bulk size to high, and uh, the way it worked is it sent this bulk over to Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch accepted it, it processed it in the background. Uh, meanwhile, the client terminated the network connection because of a timeout. It sent the next bug, and this repeated and re repeated again, and uh, response times got worse and worse and worse, and at some point the system just died because of overload. And so the fix here was really to change the default request timeout from 10 seconds to 60, for example, uh, to so the client actually waits until Elasticsearch is finished with process. Another example is uh, this. Uh, here we test with, uh, we start measuring uh, how much throughput we can achieve with one client, then two, four, and eight. And you can see that actually we get, the more clients we use, the less throughput we get. And how is this possible? This sounds like a contention issue in Elasticsearch. Like it's waiting for some lock. And if we take Elasticsearch out, out of the question and instead test only the load generator against the mock target, we actually see that the contention is in the, lock, uh, in the load generator, and the load generator had problems whenever we had uh, we increased the number of threads. Um, um, the contention was actually there, not in Elasticsearch. The third and final example here. Uh, is a bash script that sends queries to Elasticsearch. Uh, it, it reads in a while loop basically uh, a file called popular car queries, and each line contains one query, and we use curl to send data uh, to Elasticsearch. However, uh, note this little ampersand at the end. Here, uh, this means the process is put in the, in the background. And what we do is basically we, we read a line from this, um, from this file, we issue the request in the background, we read a line from this file, we issue a request in the background, and so on and so forth. And this means that we actually, um, that we actually uh, again, issue too many requests. And we know what happens then. Uh, latency goes up because we pile up requests again. So the f immediate fix is to remove this ampersand, but as we've seen before, that's also not sufficient because we actually need to throttle throughput. So in summary, for this uh, tip, you should be really critical, and uh, as always, don't trust any random script. In this case, I mean with regards to performance. Um, you should really stress test also your load generator so you know the breaking point. And you should also not trust the measurements of your load generator. So, what you, for example, what you can do is that you actually cross-check behavior on, on network level for, with tools like Wireshark. So you can measure the timestamp when a request went out, and the timestamp when a, the response came back, correlate that, um, and then find out uh, whether the measurements make a actually sense. And uh, finally, you should also test error scenarios, so you know how the tool is behaving there, whether it's reporting something 
or whether it's just going happily along. Uh, we now talked a little bit about the load generator part. Uh, let's take a step back now and consider the whole system. Um, because we can also introduce actually accidental bottlenecks uh, in the system. So in general, our uh, benchmark setup looks like this. On the, one on the one hand, we have our load generator. And on the other hand, we have our benchmark target. In this, in this example, Elasticsearch. Maybe consisting of multiple nodes maybe of just one. So, and if we do a little experiment, I said to you before that Elasticsearch is a distributed system consisting so we can add more nodes to the system. And when we start with just one node, we get, for example, a throughput of 1,300 documents per second. Then add, we add a second node and we get double the throughput. That's good. And then we add a third node and we still have the same throughput. So it looks we, had a, we had a hit a ceiling here. And the question is, mm, does Elasticsearch maybe not scale to more than two nodes? That would be rather bad. Uh, maybe it's something else. So let's check uh, with a tool called IFstat on the load generator. What's the actual network bandwidth there? And the way it looks is uh, we have a timestamp there and then we see on the load generator the amount of incoming traffic in kilobits per second and the amount of outgoing traffic in kilobits per second. And the interesting column here is the outgoing traffic because we are on, on the load generator that's sending a lot of data. So if we have a look, okay, there's not much going on. Okay, the benchmark is now starting, so we have 45,000 kilobits per second, 91,000. 127,000, 127,000, and so on. And now we do the same, uh, but we switch the hardware and we use now a 10 gigabit card. The previous one was a one gigabit card. And we do the same experiment. So 47,000, 96,000, 193,000, 271,000. So what you can see here is that we saturated the network card before and we actually measured, well, maximum throughput of our network instead of actually measuring uh, how, how much uh, Elasticsearch can handle. So we have an accidental bottleneck here. Um, so you really need to check every subcomponent of, of your system, even the ones that you might not immediately think about, like your network. Um, and you should also not approach this randomly, but rather systematically. And one approach that you can use here is the so-called use method, which stands for utilization, saturation, and errors, which, is, which has been created by Brendan Gregg. And on the page that I linked here, um, you can find a description of this methodology, uh, and including uh, specific tools for different operating systems like Linux or Windows that allow you to measure those uh, metrics. Um, the next rule is about how you actually execute your benchmarks. So, and you, you, you should do this in a structured process because if you do something like this, you update Elasticsearch and the Java version in a benchmark, this is really a recipe for disaster. So one specific case where we had this was basically a customer was updating from Elasticsearch 2 to Elasticsearch 5. And we also bumped the minimum Java version uh, with Elasticsearch 5 from 7 to 8. And uh, this, this uh, specific customer, they had uh, set a JVM flag called reserved code cache size to 64 megabyte. And uh, um, what happened is after the upgrade to uh, Java 8 and Elasticsearch 5, after a little while, um, performance, uh, CPU usage spiked at 100%, stayed at 100%, the performance dropped dramatically, uh, and they didn't know what was going on. And we investigated and found, found out uh, that, as I said, they have set this flag. And what this flag basically does is, um, it constrains the amount of memory that uh, the generated machine code that the JIT compiler 
uh, creates ends up. And in Java 7, this was set to 48 megabyte. Um, so they actually increased it from 48 to 64. OK, fine. Uh, but with Java 8, um, something changed in the JVM. And this was the JVM has multiple compilers, not just one. And um, before, you had either uh, the client compiler, or which does not optimize that heavily, or the server compiler, which, is, uh, which heavily optimizes but takes up more resources. And then some bright guy thought, oh, OK, we could actually combine those. Uh, and this is called tier compilation, this feature. So you first compile with the client compiler, and then you compile after, after, after a little while with the server compiler, and even get more optimized code. Um, however, uh, so and they changed the default, they switched this on in Java 8, and the JVM engineers also thought, oh, OK, let's raise maybe the default for res reserved code cache size to 256 megabyte. And our customer, hmm, well, just at 64 megabyte. Uh, so they actually decreased their code cache size. And what happened is uh, that the code cache ran full. And when the, uh, the code cache runs full, uh, the JVM just switches to interpreted mode. This explains the spike in CPU. And this also explains the drop in performance. So, and if they, did, uh, if they had uh, first upgraded Java from Java 7 to Java 8 and then Elasticsearch, it would have been much easier to find out what, that it was not due to Elasticsearch, but rather to the change in uh, the JVM. So what is really important is uh, that you do it one step at a time in your benchmarks. And the way it looks, it's, r it's actually rather simple, but you really have to be disciplined about this. So it's basically a three-step process. And first, you reset the environment to a known stable state. And this includes transient state, like memory contents, uh, but also uh, persistent state, as we've seen before uh, with the trim example, where uh, we had this uh, bumps in performance, and we had to trim. So it's not just about transient state. And after you, if you res reset uh, your system, you change one variable, variable, and in the third step, then you run your experiment maybe for one or more iterations, and then you repeat again. And when you do this for a while, uh, you might think to yourself, hmm, oh, what did I actually do to get these results? What did I change this flag or did I set this configuration? I don't remember. So it's really important that you document everything. And I can show you one example from our own benchmarks. This is a metrics record. It's not that important, the, uh, all the fields here. What I want to show you is the highlighted field. This is the actual value that you usually care about. And the rest is all meta information. So we capture the JVM version, the kernel version, the specific commit of Elasticsearch that we've benchmarked, the benchmark configuration, several timestamps, and so on and so on. And this allows us to actually reproduce results and know which configuration we have enabled and what, s what uh, specific commit we have actually benchmarked. And after this, this brings us now to our seventh and uh, final rule. Um, you should also use statistical significance tests in your benchmarks. So consider again our colleague Ben. Uh, he ran two benchmarks, uh, one with the old configuration, one with the new configuration, and uh, plotted indexing throughput. And if you squint a little bit, you can see that the new configuration, the config after, is actually a little bit better. But the question is, hmm, is this really right? And if you run the same benchmark over and over again in identical conditions, it might look like this if we plot the examples in a histogram. So what you see here is basically run-to-run -run variation. So it can happen that in one run, uh, you, you, end up with, uh, you end up a little bit further to the right, and sometimes your throughput ends, a little bit, uh, ends up a little bit further to the left. And so you, what do you do now? Uh, just throw your hands in the air and say, OK, I cannot do anything about this. I don't know whether performance got better or worse. Uh, no. So what you can do to mitigate this is that you run statistical significance tests. And this doesn't mean that you can get sloppy. Quite the contrary. You really need to control every, every variable that you can. So we talked about this in the section reducing noise, where you, s where you turn off system demons, uh, where you split the load generator and all that. 
Um, and then you also need to acknowledge that you cannot control everything. So run-to-run -run variation is a fact of life. For example, when you have multiple client connections, your client requests are I always interleaved a little bit differently. Also, your, the JIT compiler might uh, align uh, the, the code that the JIT compiler uh, generates might be aligned a little bit uh, differently in, in memory or the garbage collector runs at different times. All that uh, makes a difference and contributes to run-to-run -run variation. Or the operating system scheduler uh, schedules you away from, uh, migrates you away from the CPU or schedules another process that uh, trashes your cache again or something like that. Um, so that's just a fact. And uh, the way you mitigate against this is basically you do a lot of trial runs. Uh, so a ball bug is you run more than 30. That's just a ball bug. Uh, and then you do a statistical significance test, for example, a t-test, to find out um, whether the difference is really statistically significant or not. And in the additional resources and the slides at the end, I've linked a paper that explains this in great detail. So I will not go into detail here. Then, when you're done, uh, you probably do not want to report raw, raw results, but rather summarize them. And in general, you want to uh, report some kind of characteristic value for your data. And you have different choices here. One is, is the median, which means you uh, sort all your observations and you take the middle value. The mean, you sum up all your observations and divide them by the number of observations or the mode, which is the most common value. And a good choice often here is the median uh, because it's robust against outliers, just as a guideline. And uh, you should also report at least minimum and maximum because, uh, for example, it makes a difference whether you uh, report 1,000 documents per second of throughput plus minus 50 or plus minus 500 because in the second case, something weird might be going on. Um, for latency, it's not that simple because you usually do not have some characteristic value and you should use percentile distributions here. Uh, you should also not assume normal distribution because latency is usually multimodal. What this means is that you have like a fast path and a slow path. Like uh, 9 out of 10 requests might uh, just process fine and the 10th is hit by a garbage collection path and takes much longer. And this is clearly not normally distributed. To summarize, our colleague Ben is finally happy because uh, his benchmarks now run in a production-like environment. We've also considered warm-up now and do not just uh, measure immediately. We also do not hit the system as hard as we can, but rather model our workload uh, correctly according to what ha actually happens in production. We also checked our load test driver that uh, it's not causing any unexpected problems. And also, the general uh, setup does not contain any accidental bottlenecks. We follow a structured benchmarking process and uh, checked our results for statistical significance. And as a little outlook, I just want to mention how we actually benchmark in the Elasticsearch team. Uh, we have a benchmarking tool that is open source and available on GitHub. It's called Rally. And it's specifically geared towards Elasticsearch, so it, you cannot benchmark, I don't know, a REST service with it. You can just benchmark Elasticsearch with it. Um, and Rally implements many of the best practices that I've mentioned here. It cannot implement all of them. For example, it cannot spot accidental bottlenecks for you. That's your job. Um, it's also that everything is open source, so not only Rally itself, but also the data that we use for uh, for our benchmarks, our benchmark suite is open source and everything is public. So this means we publish the system configuration, so the exact hardware that we run it, our benchmarks on and also the detailed results uh, for our nightly benchmarks because I believe if we, uh, if we state performance numbers, they should be better reproducible and we should give you everything uh, so you can reproduce the numbers and make them more um, trustworthy basically. Um, 
And I want to close with this Japanese proverb, uh, because we've so now seen all those little pitfalls and it could uh, maybe le uh, make you think that you will never get this right. <laughs> um, that might be true. So uh, it's really uh, uh, a way riddled with pitfalls and problems. But you should remember that uh, you maybe fall seven times, but you should just end up eight. So you should really iterate on uh, on that process uh, and just improve over time. Thank you. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Yes. Yes, so um, several um, built in, we've built in support in Rally, for example, for Java Flight Recorder. So, uh, what you can basically do is uh, you just say, um, I want to run our benchmark. You say just Rally and then benchmark, and then you say, um, you specify a command line flag, and then it just enables, it starts Elasticsearch with Flight Recorder enabled. But uh, we also use more at uh, also ad hoc. Uh, for example, various versions, uh, mm, instances of perf. I've also used in analysis also honest profiler, for example. Uh, I don't know how it's called at the moment, but Solaris Performance Studio, you probably heard of that um, for various things. So it depends a little bit on the, uh, on the kind of thing that I want to find out, actually. There's also a plan to integrate uh, flame graph profiling, which would be rather useful to get low-level uh, things like, I don't know, CPU cache misses, uh, which part of the code causes uh, CPU, uh, how many CPU cache misses and all that. Uh, that's, uh, but I didn't get to that yet. Yeah? Um, you mean now the development team or e somebody else? <laughs> mm, okay. So, uh, as you guessed right, uh, we're basically interested, so our nightly benchmarks are for uh, testing against regressions, finding regressions, uh, and also verifying, uh, proactively verifying performance improvements. Um, for users, it's usually uh, when they want to do an upgrade of Elasticsearch, uh, they, they model, model a benchmark, basically, and then uh, want to find out, okay, is the new version performing better, worse, is it fine? Or also configuration changes, yes. So, uh, I don't know. We also had uh, users, <laughs> um, users uh, run benchmarks uh, during this uh, meltdown phase in the beginning of the year and um, attributing uh, performance drops uh, immediately to, uh, to meltdown instead of, for example, run-to-run -run variation. So, um, that can happen that like performance is like 5% different, uh, maybe. And then you say, oh, this must be meltdown because I heard about it in the news. Anything else? Yeah? Oh, um, honestly, I have to say, so it took, um, this was an internal support ticket. <laughs> And honestly, a lot of colleagues looked at it and they approached it from the angle, from, from a Lucene angle, from the Elasticsearch angle, and it took like three weeks or so. And mm, <laughs> um, well, um, I stumbled upon this ticket and uh, I, I saw the JVM flex and I said, why do they set the code cache size? And then I said, remove that. And that's what, that, that was it, basically. 
Ja. So, um, my personal take on this is that I avoid Docker and the cloud as much as I can. So, no virtualization whatsoever, it's bare metal. And the systems are, um, we also run micro benchmarks. There, the systems are heavily tuned and we isolate cores and all that. We don't do that for the macro benchmarks. Um, but those are bare metal machines that are run in a data center in Germany. There are no further questions, then I think maybe some cake is left for you. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>